cephalon, myelencephalon, and the spinal cord. In the last lecture, we also talked a little bit about different structures that were within these different brain subdivisions. What we want to do now is to look at the complexity of the internal organization of these areas. So if we look from the outside, and we talked about one or two areas in them, if we actually take the brain and cut it and turn and look at it, we see that it's very complex on the inside. We have to have a microscope to do that. We have to have some other methods for doing that. So that's what we want to talk about in this lecture is the internal organization of the brain itself. Now, when early neuroanatomists uh, took the brains out of cadavers, um, they noticed, first of all, that the brain substance was sort of like cottage cheese. This was not very good for doing any kind of dissection. Well, one of the first things that had to happen so that we could understand something about the structure of the brain was methods had to be developed so that we could look at it. And one of the most important methods was uh, discovering what kinds of chemicals would fix the brain or make it hard so that it could be sliced up and viewed. So that was one of the first things they did. When they did this and they cut into the brain and they turned and looked at it, it looked like the brain had very little natural contrast, but there were areas that looked a little bit grayish or a little bit whitish. And we still use these terms in modern neuroscience, but before we get to a definition of them, I wanted to show you a real human brain and the fact that there is very little natural contrast. I want you to look at this slice here, and this slice is taken in this plane, so it's like through the top like this, looking down. And so what you can see is there would be two hemispheres. This would be the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. And one of the first things you can see is that there's very little natural contrast. Now, these are human brain sections that were embedded in plastic, so they have a little bit of a yellowish tint. But you can see right around the external surface, there appears to be a very thin ridge or margin that's a little bit darker than on the inside. And this will become clear what this means in a minute. Also, you can see these huge holes these are the ventricles of the brain, the place Leonardo da Vinci thought cognition and perception were located. So there actually are those holes in the brain. If we look at another brain section, we see again. Now in this brain section, this is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. Here's our cerebellum right here. That's how we know that that's the back of the brain. Here you can also see there's still a little bit of darker color around the outer edge, then it's light, and then you see some darker areas again. And that's because there are different structures located within the brain substance itself. And when the early neuroanatomists cut up the brain, they saw this as well. So when they cut up the brain, they saw that there was little natural contrast, but there was enough contrast to make some areas look a little bit darker or grayer in the natural brain, and some of the areas looked a little bit whiter. Now, looking down here, just because we talked about this in our last lecture, and I always like to review information, I'm going to put my finger right here on this structure right here, which is the superior colliculus. So that's a part of the midbrain, but it's now cut in this plane. And that superior colliculus is one of the structures that is involved in visual reflexes. So this is what the brain looks like in reality. This has been fixed and again embedded in a plastic, so it's changed the color a little bit. But the early neuroanatomists noticed this difference between what they called gray matter and white matter. And for us to be able to understand what gray and white matter refer to, we need to learn something about the parts of a neuron. And a neuron is a nerve cell. So we need to look at the parts of a nerve cell. This is what I call a generic nerve cell. And what you see here is a cell body, just like any other kind of cell in the body. There's a cell and a nucleus in the middle. 
And then extending from that cell body are these funny looking structures, which are called dendrites. And dendrites are nothing more than true extensions of the cell body surface. And the name dendrite stems from the fact that early neuroanatomists thought they looked like the branches of a tree. And in fact, that's exactly what they do look like. And we'll come back to this because it's very important. Uh, our understanding of different neurons in different areas of the brain has come in large part from looking at the different kinds of dendritic trees that exist on different neurons. So here's our cell body and here's our dendrites extending away. Now, from the other part or side of the cell, you see right at this junction here, which is called the axon hillock, there's a single structure which leads away from the cell. And this is called an axon, and we'll come back to this in a minute. Right now, we have the cell body and the dendrites, which are extensions of that cell body. Early neuroanatomists developed uh, stains primarily in the 19th century that were applied to brain tissue. And what they discovered is that the areas that were a little bit darker, this so-called gray matter, were actually uh, groups of neurons or nerve cells. So the gray areas of the brain, the darker areas of the brain, is where the neuron cell bodies are located. And these neuron cell bodies form functional and structural groups. And in the nervous system, we call these nuclei. Now, sometimes a word is used in neuroscience in a way that is different from how it's used in general biology or used by the general population, and this is one of them. There's two different kind of nuclei. One we will talk about in this course, and a subject of this course, and one which is not. There's the nucleus of a cell, and that's an organelle which is located within the cell, which is where the genetic material of that cell is located. We aren't going to be talking about that. When neuroscientists use the term nuclei, they're referring to collections of neuron cell bodies that form a structure with unique characteristics and function. So if I were to say the superior colliculus is a nucleus, it means it's a specific area of the brain that has a specific function associated with it. And all it is is a collection of cell bodies into that one structure or nucleus. So think of it that way. And if, if you understand the superior colliculus as a single structure, that will be very good. Now, we had a number of um, individuals in the 19th century who developed the stains um, that have resulted in our understanding of gray matter, white matter, and how the nervous system is organized. One of them was Franz Nissel. So he developed some stains, and he didn't know why. It's kind of an, an interesting story. He cut up a lot of different areas of the brain, and he developed this cool stain. And so he cut up a bunch of sections throughout the whole body, including the brain, and he dipped them in this stain. And lo and behold, when he pulled his sections out of the stain, the nervous system lit up like a Christmas tree, but all the other structures in the body hardly stained at all. And so he said there had to be something special in the brain that was taking his dye. And he named these structures, of course, Nissel bodies. Okay? And we now know that, in fact, Neurons have a large number of these Nissel bodies in their cytoplasm. And Franz Nissel was able to identify a number of nuclear groups in the nervous system based on this. So what does a Nissel stain neuron look, look like? So let's just look at one. So this is a very nice example of a Nissel stain section through one single neuron. Now, when you look here at the neuron, this is the neuron itself here. This is its nucleus. This is where its genetic material is located. But this is just one neuron. Now, these Nissel bodies, each one of the little purple dots is where the dye, the Nissel dye, has taken up the stain. And what you notice is it's just the neuron cell bodies which are staining. Now, the dendrites of this neuron, these dendrites that extend away, they are not picking up the stain. 
so the reason for that, I told you, the dendrites are actual extensions of the cell body surface. So theoretically, they would pick up the stain, but the little nissel bodies, what is actually staining, are too fat to fit up into the dendrites. And so that's why when you stain with nissel, you just see the cell body. Now, if we look down here, however, at that axon hillock, that area where that one axonal process left the cell body, nothing at all stains there. And the reason for this is because nissel bodies are not found in the axon at all. So dendrites are true extension of the cell body, so they would stain with this if we left them in there long enough. But the axon would never stain. So this is one single neuron, and this is the same stain that was developed by Franz Nissel in the 19th century. Now, if we wanted to look at a nucleus in the brain, this is an example of one nucleus. So let me tell you a little bit about this nucleus. This nucleus is called the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. It is a single nucleus which is found in the diencephalon, specifically within the thalamus. This is the whole nucleus here, which looks like a knee, which is what the word geniculate means. And it's located laterally in the thalamus. And you remember the thalamus was a large structure that was made up of a number of individual areas. Well, it's a number of individual nuclei. And this is one nucleus in the thalamus. Each one of the little tiny dots you see here is an individual neuron that's staining with the nissel stain. So this one nucleus has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of neurons, but it forms a structure that has a unique structure. The lateral geniculate is infamous for being a layered structure like this. And this nucleus would also have its own individual connections to other areas of the brain, and it also has a unique function. So let me give you an example. Here's our lateral geniculate. We'll be talking a lot about the lateral geniculate nucleus. The lateral geniculate nucleus is the nucleus in the thalamus that receives input from the eye. And it is the neurons that are in the lateral geniculate that will be the first neurons that will project to the cortex so that a percept of the external world in terms of vision can be formed. So again, this is one nucleus in the thalamus and just shows you how these methods have been used to look at the internal structure of the brain. We can't see the lateral geniculate from the gross uh, view of the brain. We have to cut up the brain and stain it in a particular way to be able to look at it. And the thalamus, again, has many nuclei. Each of them look different. Each of them have different connections. And each of them have different functions. And so this is just one example of a nucleus. Now, using other techniques, it was discovered that the lighter areas of the brain, the parts of the brain that in the fresh brain look kind of whitish, were made up of axons. So let's go back again to our generic neuron. White matter is made up of myelinated axons in the nervous system. We'll define these terms now. Let's go back and look at our generic neuron. So Nissel is going to stain the cell body and it would theoretically stain its extensions uh, if they were big enough. So Nissel stains this. Other stains, were developed that stained these axons. And this is how early neuroanatomists learned that the white matter of the brain was actually made up of axons. Now, these early stains that were developed um, were stains, uh, for example, uh, there was an individual named Carl Weigert. He was one of the individuals who developed one of the most important of the stains the stain that he developed actually stains a structure which surrounds the axon, and this is called a fatty myelin sheath. So all myelin is, is like, imagine if you had an electrical wire and it was insulated. 
So all this is, think of the axon as an electrical wire, and we'll come back to that. That's not a bad analogy. And periodically, there's insulation around that wire, and that's the smiling sheath. You notice that there's breaks in it, and we will come back to the significance of those breaks. But these are the axon. The axon is not just an extension of the cell body like dendrites are. It is actually a specialized structure, and that will become very important when we talk about how neurons actually work. This is a Weigert stain section through the human brain, and here's what you're looking at. This is a section that was just cut through the top of a brain like this, and we're just looking at it from the undersurface, and you see that there's an outer part here which doesn't appear to be staining, so it appears very light. Well, it's light because the Weigert stain stains axons, so this area which is black is staining the myelin sheath of axons that lie beneath the cortical mantle which is made up of neurons. So the cortex of the brain, which is all this light area here, is the cortical mantle or layer of neurons on the external surface of the telencephalon. And beneath that lies a huge number of axons. And these axons may be traveling up into the cortex or they may be the axons of cells in the cortex going down. But this shows you a Weigert stain section of the brain. Now, in the modern era, we can look at axons or white matter in the brain in other ways. So we can actually stain, we can actually cut a section which would um, basically allow for intracellular organelles to show up, and we would be able to stain those so we can actually stain things that are inside of an axon. So we don't now have to rely on staining of the myelin sheath or that fatty structure that's located around the axon. We can actually stain things that are within the axon. Another thing that we can do in the modern era is we have special techniques where we actually inject substances into the brain and those substances are specifically picked up by neurons and transported only in axons. And so we visualize them by doing, you know, special techniques with the brain and looking at them. So let's look at one. This is, believe it or not, the superior colliculus of a toad right here. <laughs> this is the superior colliculus of a toad. Here's where his brain midline is right here. Here's part of his ventricular system. And there'd be another big superior colliculus over here that's been cut away. But in this animal, I injected a substance into the eye. And by cutting up the brain and treating it a certain way, the axons, which have this uh, substance in them, shows up dark brown. So this shows you that in the toad, the main structure in the brain that receives input from the eye is the superior colliculus. Now, I want you, let's just stand back for a minute. Remember that example of a nucleus? I gave you the lateral geniculate nucleus. In human beings, the lateral geniculate is the main structure to get input from the eye. Although our superior colliculus, which is very small by comparison to that of a toad, also receives visual input. So the lateral geniculate is going to project its axons to the cortex for the formation of a percept about vision, but the eye also projects, just like it does in the toad, to the superior colliculus for visual reflexes for us. But in the toad, those visual reflexes are going to involve catching prey in space, whereas for us, it will be involved in other types of visual reflexes. So this is how we are going to look at the axons in the brain. Now, finally, there's a special method, which is developed by an Italian neuroanatomist, Camello Golgi. And in this method, and believe it or not, in the modern era, we still don't know why the Golgi method works. This is just unbelievable. Uh, Camello Golgi lived between 1843 and 1926. We still have not figured out why his method works. 
But in this method, which he developed, silver impregnates a neuron and its dendritic processes. And you say, why is this such an incredible method? Well, this is an incredible method because lo and behold, when it's applied to the brain, one of the reasons, for reasons we have no idea, it only actually fills about 1% of the cells which are present. And what this has allowed us to do is to cut very thick sections through the brain, process them as Golgi did, and look at the dendritic arbors of neurons. And from this, we have been able to determine that there's a large number of different kinds of neurons in the brain. And this is the method that gave us um, that understanding. Uh, as a little sidelight, this method is really kind of funny because in one particular part of it, you use something called oil of oregano, which means that for about a week, your lab smells like concentrated pizza. So that's just a little aside. But... The important thing about this method is that it revealed a structure of the nervous system that neither Nissel nor Weigert revealed to us. So let's just look at a Golgi impregnated section. Now, for the novice person, it's a little hard to understand Golgi sections all the time, and that's because other things become impregnated and pick up the silver. But this is where we want to focus our attention. This is a neuron cell body. This is one of its dendrites extending away from the cell body right here. Just one dendrite. And off from the base of this cell, you see a huge number of dendrites also extending in, in a, a huge plane around the base of the cell. Now, one of the other reasons the Golgi method was valuable in the adult brain is because axons do not impregnate in the adult brain. So you can only follow the axon for a little short period and then it stops. So what this method has really been used for is to show a difference in the elaboration of dendritic trees. And all you have to do is think about what this neuron looks like and its dendritic trees look like and how different that is from the generic neuron that show dendrites that look different from these. And what we're going to learn is there's about 150 different kinds of neurons based primarily on differences in their arbors. Now, to give you a feel for this, um, it's a little bit like thinking in these terms. For those of you who know something about trees, if you look at trees in the winter time and you see their branches, Anybody who's knowledgeable can tell a maple from an oak by the way their branches look. Well, this is exactly what happens in the nervous system. Very specific types of neurons are found in very specific areas of the brain. There is nothing that is random in the brain. And these 150 neuron types are distributed very specifically in the brain. In the modern era, we don't use the Golgi method as much as we used to. What we do now is inject dyes or substances into the cell body, and they can be incorporated into the dendritic trees. So let me give you an example of that, just so you can see that, in fact, the dendritic trees really do look different in different neurons. So here you see... This has had a dye injected into it, and by using fluorescence microscopy, you can see that in this neuron, dendrites extend like a radiating star away from the cell body. Instead of in our last example, where we had one dendrite coming up like this, it was actually going towards the surface of the brain, and we had them radiating dendrites just from the base of the cell. In this cell, the dendrites radiate in all directions. So this is how we have learned about the tremendous diversity of neurons. And in fact, neurons are the most diverse cell type in the entire body. And if anything goes awry in neurons becoming specialized in different areas, then those areas of the brain do not function normally. Now, by using various methods or combinations of methods, what we can do is look at the brain and look at its internal structure. So why don't we just start and do that and look through some of these areas of the brain now, 
that we looked at before, but now we're going to see that they're a great deal more complex than we thought they were. So let's look through our telencephalon, diencephalon. So here, this is cut in this plane, like this. So what you see are two sides to the brain. All of the sections I'm going to show you are cut in this plane. Here's your ventricular system. See, they really are holes in the brain. And one is a midline structure that would be located right here. So, dorsally, you have your thalamus. And ventrally, you have your hypothalamus. Now, I want you to look at all this. All the pink areas are where nuclei are at. This would be the gray matter of the brain. This is gray matter, this is gray matter, this is gray matter. Over here is another nucleus. These are all individual nuclei that are located in this area of the brain. In the, it's a sort of telencephalic, diencephalic junction. Where you see black structures, these are the axons of the brain. So the pink areas have been stained with a stain that makes the cells show pink. And the black areas are the areas where the axons are located and are shown dark. And you see that the internal organization of the brain is indeed very complex. If we then go to the mesencephalon or midbrain and we cut through it and we look, lo and behold, here's what we're going to see, two sides again. This is our ventricle now is just very small. It's just a little hole. Dorsally, these two structures right here, this is the superior colliculus. So here's our superior little hill right here. Now, in between the two superior colliculi, wow, there's Descartes' pineal right there. So you see that it was a midline structure. There was only one of them. And so that's why he thought it was the seat of the rational soul and where that rational soul could interact with the body. Now, I want to point out one other structure here. Again, all the pink areas are nuclei or the light areas are nuclei and all of the dark areas are where the white matter or axons are located. Let's come down to this light pink area right here. This is a major structure in the midbrain called the substantia nigra. And I point it out to you here because it will be the topic of our lecture on Parkinson's disease because it is specifically this area of the brain that degenerates or which is abnormally functioning in Parkinson's disease and results in the devastating motor consequences to the person. This is a section through the metencephalon. Again, the pink areas are where the nuclei are located or the neuron cell bodies. The dark areas, the dark areas are where the axons are located. Here is our ventricle. This is a, our hole in the brain again. Here's our ventricular system. This is our cerebellum up here, and this is our pons right here. And now you can see why the pons is called the bridge. These axons come out of neurons in the pons and project to the cerebellum to let the cerebellum know what movement has been initiated by the cortex. So the pons is going to get information from the cortex that initiates a motor movement, then the neurons here will send their axons into the cerebellum so the cerebellum knows what the motor cortex wants to do. And now you know why the pons is called the bridge. It's the bridge to the cerebellum between the cerebellum and the brain. The myelencephalon, which is the uh, area of the brain that will be continuous with the spinal cord, the myelencephalon most of the areas up here have been cut away, but this is where the ventricular system would be. And all you see down here is that there are a number of different nuclei again. Here's a huge nucleus. Let me just point out two. One is a nucleus located right here. And I pointed out to you because I kept talking about how toads had that tongue, that, you know, the reflex for catching uh, flies in space or whatever from... This is the structure that receives the input from the superior colliculus. And in the toad, 
it allows them to catch prey in space. This nucleus in human beings is useful for helping us keep our tongue out of the way when we chew and when we talk. And so the nucleus still controls the tongue, but it is specific, the mechanism by which it does it and exactly how it does it is um, a characteristic of the function of the niche of the animal. So what I wanted to show you in this lecture is that if you just looked at the brain, a fresh brain, you'd see there was gray matter and there's white matter. And when you look in the internal structures and you stain them with different dyes, this is how the early neuroanatomists discovered that the brain was made up of a bunch of different areas. And it's been the modern era where we've been able to determine the connections between all these different areas and also the function of each of these areas of the brain. There are thousands of nuclei and thousands of pathways connecting them in the brain. And that's part of what our course will be about is to look at specific systems and how these nuclei and areas are connected. Thank you.